I'm going to be playing and demonstrating with this amazing piece, which is Beethoven's Seventh Symphony in the Liszt transcription for solo piano. This is one of the most important works in all of music history. It is so unbelievably important because of what Beethoven did in his time, and then what Liszt did with this piece, and then all the different things behind it that make it possible to play this piece. Uh, you know, obviously, this is not the Liszt Sonata or some major work in the repertory for pianists. So it might be strange to think, you know, why are we doing a master class on this piece, which very few people are actually going to play. But that's why this is so great. It's, there, there are so many things in this music that demonstrate some basic principles so it's a wonderful platform to talk about piano technique, about pedal technique, about music, about the piano in general, like why are we playing the piano, what makes the piano interesting, and all of this is in, in this piece, so we're going to touch on all of that. Let's start with something which is, a, for me, kind of a mind-blowing idea related to this piece. Now, we have lots of recordings of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. Uh, Furtwängler, Mengelberg, uh, uh, Karajan, uh, uh, you know, all these, all these amazing Bernstein, all these amazing uh, recordings, but they're all from the 20th century. There's nothing, no recording from the 19th century when Beethoven was alive. This is perhaps the only thing that we can point to that might be considered almost like a recording from Beethoven's time, because Liszt met Beethoven. Beethoven gave him a kiss on the head when he, was a, when he was a kid. Liszt knew every musician who was alive during his time. He worked with orchestras. He worked with musicians who played with Beethoven. He talked with people who studied with Beethoven. He knew Beethoven personally, and he also knew the traditions around Beethoven's music and the performance of the time. And for someone like Liszt, who was a composer and a performer who understood all the, uh, all the, all the needs for music, you know, I need to write this with a line because performers need to do that. I need to write this fingering. I need to write this slurring. Those details, you don't get that in uh, a music critic review. You know, a music critic rev reviewer is not going to say, oh, well, you know, this, this slur is, is supposed to be longer or this slur can be shorter. They don't care about those details. They're, they're worrying about the general effect. So they will tell you, like, oh, Beethoven, you know, conducted this too fast or too slow or it's too messy or too clean, whatever. But we need a musician to talk about the details, the musical details that really change the interpretation of the performance. And this is what Liszt has done with these, with these incredible transcriptions. He takes all of the details in Beethoven's score and translates it to the piano. And it's incredible how much detail he was able to incorporate into the piano score. And because of that, we can, we can be more conscious of what Beethoven wrote. We can be more conscious of the really careful attention that Beethoven paid to, to how he wrote uh, the notes. And I want to use an example. Let's start right away with an example from the second movement. Um, now, this is the famous movement, of course, at the premiere of this symphony uh, in Vienna. Uh, Beethoven was there. And I, th I think he was conducting. and. and they played the first movement, everybody loved it, there was applause. They played the second movement, and there was so much applause that they had to play the second movement again, right away. They had to encore the second movement before they even finished the symphony. So this movement is the, this very famous. So in this simple phrase, we have three different ways of articulating 
the notes. This is how Beethoven chose. Uh, just a regular note, a quarter note with no dot, with no line or slur. And then a quarter note with a dot, and uh, an eighth note with a dot. And then you have an eighth note with a dot and a slur. So in this very simple melody, which, which is almost not a melody, you already have all these different choices of articulation. And Beethoven is very clear and very consistent. Every time it comes in music, boom, he writes the same combination of dots and no dots and lines. And particularly the last note. He writes a quarter note. Rest. In Liszt's transcription for the piano, he reproduces all of these articulations, except for one. At the end, the last note, the quarter note, he puts a dot on the quarter note. And this is a very deliberate choice because Liszt is just as consistent as Beethoven in writing the dot on the last note as Beethoven is to not write a dot ever on that last note. So what does this mean? This is an incredible moment intellectually this is Liszt interpreting Beethoven. Knowing what Beethoven wrote, it's very clear that he was conscious, but somehow he was interpreting, he was enhancing something, he was exaggerating something to create an effect. So first, what does this say to us? This, this is what an interpreter does. An interpreter looks at the score, which is a moment in time, and decides how to go through that moment in time. Are they coming at it from this direction to go in that direction? Or are they coming at it from this direction to go in that direction? And these two interpretations all go, both go through the same point, but they go in opposite directions. That's why we can have one Beethoven symphony and hear so many different versions of it. And all of them can be totally legitimate because they all go through this point, which is one moment. But you need two points to create a line. Yes? And so what Liszt is doing is giving us a line. He's giving us an interpretation. For me, this is how I, I see the dot. This rhythm that Beethoven creates keeps going and going and going and going. Mm. Nothing. So in Beethoven, that silence is so important because it's the first time we have a silence. And Liszt is interpreting that. He says this silence is so surprising and so full of meaning and so full of surprise that I want to emphasize that. I want to exaggerate that a little bit. I want to make sure people notice that there is a rest there. And so he puts a dot on the quarter note before to make the rest even more like underline, underline. And this is what an interpreter does. So listen to the effect. So now we have an idea that was in Beethoven already, but which, and there are many ideas, 
And Liszt has chosen at least this one to make it something a little more special because Liszt felt as a, as a musician, as a listener, as a performer of this music, I think this is really incredible. And I'm going to make sure everybody experiences it that way. So this is a, if, if we heard a recording of Liszt, if somehow there was recording technology in Liszt's time, and we heard him conducting this symphony, we would hear him probably say to the orchestra, okay, put a dot on that last note, make it short. I want to hear the silence. And we would hear, boom, 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 boom. And Liszt would probably stand there with the, <laughs> with the baton and like, like that. So this is why this transcription is so important, because it's the only real link that we have with performance practice in Beethoven's time. There is no other real interpreter who has given us so much detail about how this piece was performed in the time of Beethoven, in, in the 19th century. The reason we need to respect Liszt's perspective is that he knew Beethoven. He understood the importance of Beethoven's work much sooner than a lot of, con even a lot of composers. He, he understood the genius of Beethoven and he spent those years when he was touring in his 20s and 30s, he spent those years promoting Beethoven's music to his audience. He transcribed the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh symphonies to perform in those concerts. So the seventh symphony, actually there's a, there's a first version, an early version, which is also very interesting to to examine and to compare because now we have three lines. We have Beethoven, three points. We have Beethoven, we have the first version, we have the second version, and we can see how Liszt changes directions and makes, makes different decisions. And the reason the second version is so incredibly interesting is because Liszt retired from performing on the piano and spent many years conducting in Weimar. And he conducted performed this piece. I'm sure he worked on this with his orchestra uh, many times. And so he got to know the piece as a performer at the piano, intimately trying to recompose it for the piano. He got to know it as a composer, as a, as a conductor, conducting it and dealing with string players and bowings and articulations and balance and things like that. And then this incredible thing that he did in the 1860s, where he took more than a year of his time. And he went to this little monastery in Rome and basically did a, a music retreat for himself. And, and he stayed in this small little room where he had a bed, he had a desk, and he had a little spinet piano. And he spent I think it was 16 months. He spent these 16 months working on these nine symphonies and creating this piano transcription of all nine of the, of the pianos, uh, the, the uh, symphonies of Beethoven. It was a, a kind of, it, it was kind of meditation for him. It was his spiritual work that he felt he needed to do. And I think he needed to do it because he, he understood that Beethoven's music needed this kind of document. And he was the one who could provide that because he was a performer, because he knew Beethoven, because he was uh, this proponent of Beethoven. I think because Liszt spent this time working on these symphonies and really getting to know it, he really understood that his work was important. And that was, that's why we need to spend time with this music. Even though today now we have all of these orchestras and we have recordings and we can hear this music played anytime we want. But this is still something special. I want to talk about another detail, which is a kind of controversial in this piece. And so it's the next line, uh, this melody that comes.
and the controversy is over this grace note. It's written as a grace note. It's not 16th notes. And so there's, there are two ways that you can think, or three ways you can think about performing it. The usual way that we hear today, So on the beat and very measured. Another way to do it would be on the beat but quick as a grace note. And the third way would be before the beat. As opposed to All of the, I, not all, 95% of conductors in the 20th century play it on the beat, and most of them play it the slow measured way. So, And this is, I think, a tradition that started in Germany probably just before recordings uh, were invented before recording technology was invented. So that's you know, like 80 years after Beethoven, maybe 100 years after Beethoven. So there were 100 years of different generations of musicians saying this and that and, and, and communicating this or that. And all of this is oral tradition. So we don't really know who was right and who was wrong, like who, who was the, the person, the conductor, who all of a sudden said, oh, I'm going to play this on the beat, or who decided that that was right. What we have in the piano transcription is a written document that says it should be played before the beat. There are places where the notes are written so that you can only play them before the beat, and fingerings that show and it has to be played before the beat because the fingering he gives is on the beat, the notes that are on the beat and not the grace notes. Which means, it's, this is how Beethoven heard it and, and played it. For me, this is proof, and it is the only proof. And there are many justifications for playing it on the beat, the way conductors do it now. Uh, Kleiber makes a very convincing argument to keep this beat going. Boom, 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 would be disruptive in his mind. So he puts bum 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 ba da 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 da. So there's some musical logic to that, but logic is not necessarily the truth. And so you can still play it this way. You can still play it on the beat and slow and measured. But when you see Liszt's version, then you have to really think. You know, do I want to make that argument, or do I want to play what Liszt wrote? and see what that means for how to play Beethoven. So those are two, I think, very important details that tell us why we need to study this piece, uh, not just for performing it, but for understanding Beethoven and for understanding Liszt and how their relationship uh, was so special, uh, unlike anything else in history. The other thing I want to talk about, kind of on a broader level, which this transcription really brings out, is, is, is a more kind of a human element. What makes it so 
compelling to play a, a transcription of an orchestral piece at the piano. And this really speaks to a kind of deep, how can I say, a philosophic meaning of piano playing. You know, the opening of this piece, this incredible A major chord, where the whole orchestra comes, the, the conductor goes boom like this, and the whole orchestra, every, every person in the, in the stage, boom, plays, and they play together. The attack comes all at the same time, and they're all coordinated. And this is an amazing thrill, it's an amazing shock, it's a, it's a surprise, it's an adrenaline, oh, like this. And this is fundamentally why we have orchestral playing. This is why we have groups that play together, because it demonstrates something which is very fundamentally human, which is our ability to work together. You know, each of us is an individual, and we think of ourselves as, oh, it's me and everybody else. But in a moment like that opening of the symphony, it's we can all work together and become one. So 70 people on stage, boom, all of a sudden become one thing, coordinated by the conductor to, do, to play this piece. And of course, there are other moments, the different fugues at different places where you have a melody and accompaniment, and it's very clear that there are many things happening. And that's important as well, how to coordinate all of these different musicians who are doing different things so that the music comes together to become one thing. But this is, I think, the primary message of, of orchestral music, of orchestral playing is, how can many people combine to do one, how to be one, to do one thing? The piano is the opposite. The piano provides the other side of the formula. Especially a piano transcription of an orchestral piece, because all of a sudden, what do we understand that the piano can do that becomes so clear? It's that the piano is the only instrument that can do more than one thing at a time, totally independently. It's the only instrument that can play more than one note at a time, where each of those notes can be a different pitch, a different duration, a different attack, a different dynamic level, a different rhythm, and all of that controlled by one person. And this is also a very human characteristic. Yeah, this is the flip side of an individuals coming together. This is one individual is so self-sufficient in some ways that they can do many things at the same time. An individual can be more than one person. And not just be more than one person, but be more than one person at the same time, at any moment. We can split our personalities. We can have multiple thoughts in our mind, thoughts that maybe are contradictory to each other, that don't make sense when they, you put them next to each other. But we can hold both of those ideas in our mind. That's something very human. And being able to play more than one thing at an instrument in real time. You know, we're not talking about electronic music where you record this and then you play something else and you put it together. You, know, you can combine things uh, you know, with technology now. But the piano is this incredible instrument that you can control in real time to do more than one thing. So even so, let's let's look at this at the very beginning of this this symphony. What are the different things that are happening? There's the chords. And then there's the oboe. one line by itself. So here we have already this, Beethoven is playing with this idea of the group and one single instrument. And the oboe, I think, he picked the oboe very consciously because it's such a pure 
thin sound. And so to contrast this group with this very thin sound. Beethoven is thinking about this very consciously as a musical message. How does the group and the individual, how do they interact? How do they influence each other? Eventually, the oboe just keeps playing and keep, just stays on its track, da, 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 and then the violins start coming in with it, and then the other instruments start coming with it, and then all of a sudden, the oboe is leading the group. Whereas at the beginning, the group was its own thing. So this is the moral message of this opening of the symphony. And we can do this all on the piano because we can play short chords and loud chords and chords that are in the low part of, of the keyboard. That's down here. That's this thing. And then this is long and quiet and just one note, and it's up here in this register. So the piano can do this whole thing, and we need to think about this as pianists. When we play this, we need to understand what are we trying to do, not play the notes. We need to play the notes and do what Liszt did, understand the meaning and exaggerate those things to make it obvious to the listener. So I want to play this and this in a totally different way so that the listener goes. Oh, this. That's one thing, that's one idea, one element, and that this is another element. So that even though there's two measures between this chord and the next chord, and two measures before this, and two measures to this, we hear that as one thing. And that's my job as a pianist to think about that and to play this in a way where it's very clear. As soon as I play the first chord, that's a thing. I have defined that as one element. So that when I play the second chord, I need to redefine re that so that those two chords become a unit. And I need to play this in a way where it's defined as well, that this gentle and very precise, thin sound becomes a thing. It becomes its own element. And these two things interact in a way that then becomes very exciting. Then later in the piece, we find both of these elements, the big chords that come at long intervals, the long held notes that are very gentle and which interact with each other. These two things continue throughout this movement and they come closer and closer and closer together until it's all mixed together and, and, uh, and it's very exciting. And that's the moral message of this. So as, as pianists, we need to be constantly looking for ways to create layers. Yeah, that's the primary job of a pianist, is to create layers of perception. Uh, 
there's a, there's a wonderful place. There's a great place at the end where uh, we can talk a little bit about how to use uh, some of the petals to create these different kinds of, of, of layers. In the second, at the end of the second movement, we have these uh, di, da, da, this di, da, da motif being passed around in the orchestra. The violins, flutes, the flute and oboe, the oboe and clarinet, French horn and, and bassoon, all of these in the orchestra have different colors and are very easily recognizable. And also in the orchestra, it's playing over here, then all of a sudden it's playing over here, over here. It's physically also different, coming from different places. So it's kind of like a little sound game that, that Beethoven is playing. So we need to be thinking about this as we are playing this on the piano to specifically create different experiences for each of these. So we need to use the left pedal, for example, to create these different colors of something soft or something very precise. So for example, at the end, that's flute and oboe, and it's a flute on top. So the flute has this very airy kind of indistinct kind of fuzzy profile. And then the next one goes to the oboe and the clarinet with the oboe on top. And the oboe is this very precise kind of sound. So we need to give it a more precise profile. And putting the two next to each other, makes it clear that it's two different things. And we need to hear this in our mind as pianists and look for those colors in the piano, using the left pedal to try to find as different colors as possible for those two. And the next one is uh, French horn and bassoon, and those have a very kind of muffly and, and indistinct sound. So we have soft, clean and clear, muffled, and then pizzicato strings, very clean. And again, we have flute, oboe, horn and bassoon, Wind instruments, pizzicato. The only way that that can come across on the piano is if we hear those sounds of the orchestra and we try to imitate the character of those sounds. And we use the pedals as much as possible to to create these different contrasts and to show that this is not this, this is not that. And by showing those contrasts, that's what we're, this is the, the primary uh, goal of the piano is to create layers, to create different perceptive layers that exist at the same time. Oh, flute sound, that's that soft kind of indistinct profile, that's there. Oboe, that's here. Bassoon and horn, that's here. Strings, pizzicato, that's there. Yeah. You know, in, in the score, it's very clearly marked which instruments are playing which parts. And so here he writes flute and oboe, and then here oboe and clarinet, a horn and bassoon, uh, chords, pizzicato. He doesn't tell you how to play them, but he definitely tells you what you're trying to imitate. And I. I don't know the instruments of the time of Liszt. I don't know how much variety of color, how much control you can have. Today's piano, you have a lot of control and you have the possibility of reproducing. Not the exact sound of the flute. Obviously, that doesn't sound like a flute with the attack, but it has more of a flute quality. Yeah? And we need to, to enter into the piano world and, and allow ourselves to believe 
that the piano can somehow create different colors, and then all of a sudden the differences become much more extreme. Yeah? And all of the suggestions are here. And the experimentation and, and the, actual, the actual execution has to be in, in the pianist's mind, and then using the instrument and the pedals to, to try to create that. There's another part at the end of the first movement where we can talk about sostenuto pedal technique to create these different kinds of uh, layers. There's a part here where you have the first violins and the second violins passing the line. So, and So it's kind of an echo effect. It's, it's kind of a, a question response. So we don't want to give the impression that it's one line. That's jumping around. We want this line to be here and this line to be here, just behind it. And we want to see these two things as something separate. And what makes it possible to hear that is a, is a very, it's such a small detail that it's almost crazy to think that this could make a difference. Um, and this is a moment I want to show a painting of Magritte. Magritte has this amazing painting where you see a window with curtains and you see uh, through the window, you see the, the countryside. And you think, oh, this is a beautiful painting, still life of window, you see through it into the countryside. Then you start noticing the tiniest details. In the curtain, there's a little detail that's, that shows you, wait, something is covering the curtain. There's something in front of the curtain. It's the edge of a canvas. Wait a second, if that's the edge of the canvas, then all of this in front of the window is actually a canvas that's showing the scene behind it. And then you can't believe that, because over here, there's nothing that, that shows that detail. But then up here, there's another little detail. Oh, that's the edge of the canvas again. So this whole thing all of a sudden becomes redefined, not as a window, but as a big art canvas in front of a window. And your understanding of the, of the whole painting, because this is all being done in a painting, your whole understanding of the painting completely shifts. Because of this tiny detail, everything else is redefined. So this is why it's so important to, be, to have this kind of precision and to understand what, is, what are the little details that are giving the audience the clues to understanding what you're playing. Yeah. So here, this is the passage. So you just go low and high, low and high, low and high. If we're not careful, it becomes one thing that goes back and forth between low and high. What I want to create is the sense that there are two things. One is low and one is high, and that they're both going very steadily in their own world, kind of responding to each other in the, in the sense that they are parallel, but they're not one thing that's going up and down, up and down. That's too difficult. So how do we create this idea that the low thing is separate from the high thing? It's very difficult to do it with dynamics because they're both in pianissimo. So we don't want to play one louder than the other. It's not that one is more important. And when you play something louder, it becomes more important. So we don't want to do that. Already we have the low register and high register, but that doesn't seem to be enough because melodies do go back and forth within an octave, and this is what's happening here. So we need some other element to do that. And I think also to have the right pedal down 
kind of washes the whole thing in one color so that it becomes one unit that has this kind of general resonance. And that doesn't help create this layer either. So we need to find a way to make this with the silence afterwards. And how do we hear a silence? A silence is surrounded by non-silence. So we need to have that, we need to be able to hear that moment where this, that attack, and then the lift up. So we need to do that in the low voice and the high voice. And this is where this painting of Magritte comes to mind. What defines the things that are there? What, what makes it clear for me that there are two things? It's when both of them are sounding at the same time. This moment here is the key moment. This is the edge of the canvas on the curtain. This moment. Dissonance. So we need to have that combination of notes together very clearly in our minds. The only way we can do that is to hold it. Now, of course, that's very difficult to do physically if I'm not using pedal at all. I can't use the right pedal to do that, so the solution is to use sostenuto pedal. And this is an unusual use of sostenuto because usually we're holding a bass note and doing harmonies above it. But this is a technique that I developed called surgical pedaling for sostenuto, where you're picking a single note among all the different notes. You're picking out one note to hold and by holding it, it becomes a separate thing. So. I'm exaggerating there to show it how it's working. I'm using the sostenuto to hold the note and also to release it when I want to release it, to make it obvious that it's independent from the notes, the other notes that are happening. Holding that, release, holding, holding, release. The key is now how to do that in the tempo with this constant bass in the cellos and, and double basses. Fortunately, it's staccato, so we can, we can work around that very easily with the sostenuto pedal. So. If we do it cleanly enough, and especially that very first time when it happens, that's like noticing the edge of the canvas in the painting. You might not notice it at first, but you have eight times to do it in this particular passage. Even if it happens at time four or five or six, it's like, oh wait, 
I have to rethink this whole section of back and forth. And as soon as it becomes redefined, it's impossible to see it the other way. As soon as you see the edge of the canvas in the Magritte, it's impossible to not see the whole thing as a canvas in front of the window. Yeah? So those are some ideas for, for how to deal with these issues that are in this particular work. And of course, they apply to all piano pieces, I think. But particularly, they apply to these orchestral transcriptions where it's so, uh, where the, 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 it's an obvious challenge to try to create these layers. But the reason I think that Liszt was drawn to transcriptions, the reason that Liszt did so well with transcriptions in the first place is because Liszt understood that this basic concept was important to piano playing, which is to create layers, to give the impression of more than one thing happening at the same time. And that's, I think, the, the real, the, the ultimate message that I want to leave leave you with in this, uh, in, in this masterclass is to always look for those different layers in the music, to use dynamic differences, to use pitch differences, to use uh, voicing differences, to use color differences, to use uh, duration differences, rhythm differences, uh, attack differences. All of these things allow you to differentiate from one note to another and to then group them together and create these, these unbelievable interacting parts. And to understand as pianists we have this important role that only we can do, which is to provide the counterpart to the orchestra. Now, it's not that we're trying to play the orchestra music and take over the orchestra. No, we're, we are trying to provide the other side, the missing part. Uh, which is to show that the individuals can do more than one thing at a time. And I think if we can do that at any moment with piano music, then we've done our job. <laughs> <laughs>